started slacklining like in 2006. Basically I saw it in the garden of my neighbor, which was a pretty rare sight at that time because almost no one was slacklining back then. He was a climber, so he had a little slack on his garden, and I tried there for the first time, and I first thought it wasn't for me. A couple of months later, we had a slack line behind the climbing gym. There, I just tried again and again, and at some point, I managed to walk across it. It felt really good. It felt like something I've never felt before. Slacklining originated in uh, the Yosemite Valley in California, where basically climbers started to walk on their ropes first. And then at some point they actually came across the idea of using their flat webbings, which they used for slings, which was well better suited than ropes or round chains. And they quickly discovered that balancing on this webbing is pretty fun. But then it took like almost 20 years until the sport actually uh, reached Europe. And in Europe it was where the sport actually grew and where it developed. Highlining most of the time happens between cliffs or in the nature. So it is a very outdoorsy sport. But sometimes we also go to the city and we rig the slacklands between buildings. And this is always a very special thing because it is not quite the regular environment we highlight in. In an urban environment, it's a bit different because you've got the noises of the city, uh, people are watching, um, and besides that, it's not buildings, you know, buildings are harsher than mountains and trees. Urban highlining is our attempt to take a sport where usually we have to run away into the mountains to be allowed and trying to get access and permission to do it in more local spots such as this where we get to take an elevator instead of climbing a First, when looking to, for buildings to highlight on, we went all around the city, just, just walking around. We said, oh, here's a nice line, here could be a nice line. When we were here, we, we, we thought about a couple of lines. And then uh, Katie from Gamma 6, he, she uh, offered us to stay here and uh, to sleep and to have the festival here. And now everybody can just stay at the office building. It's made for hundreds of people. It's just super nice to be able to have the high lines and everything to, and together. And to be really, uh, yeah, to have like a tight space where everybody is. Slacklining, when you start, you do it in the park. You do it between trees or in your garden, like pretty much a small line, not very high up. And that's where you take your first steps. And once you progressed over this very initial challenge of just balancing on the slack line, you can come up with all kinds of tricks on this line. So trick lining is probably the most athletic form of slacklining, where you have a very tensioned and pretty short line close to the ground where you mostly jump on the line, so you really like jump up and down on your butt, on your chest, on your feet, and you try to do like as many tricks as possible. You do back flips, front flips, all kinds of rotations, and well, it's the only form of slack learning which also has a proper contest scene, I would say. I got into trick lining through videos on the internet because 
I've been into slacklining, but then I watched all these crazy videos of like Alex Mason doing double flips, and I wanted to do this too. I'm most proud of like butt backflips to butt front flips to see. Like the best combo I can do right now. There is a um, new facet of highlining which just developed in the last couple of years, which we call Highline Freestyle. So it is about doing all kinds of uh, rotations or spins and stuff like that on a high line as well, where you never really like fully leave the line. While on the freestyle highlining, you're always kind of connected with the line, but you still move up and down or sideways with the line on a bounce and a surf. The act of surfing a slack line is just bouncing back and forth, swinging back and forth. Every line, different tensions, different stretches, creates a different wave, and you get to choose exactly the wave you want. Could you tell us about the Luke Skywalker move? <laughs> well, the Luke Skywalker is a um, pretty interesting um, idea, I would say. It's like an idea a lot of people had, um, like already maybe 30 years ago when they started highlining. So people kind of came up with the idea of swinging around and like landing back on the line after a fall already like in the 80s. But no one really like pursued it, like no one really pushed it or tried it. So it took me like a couple hundred attempts I guess to, to finally really stick it. And I was lucky enough to be the first one to do it. So I got to name it Luke Skywalker. I guess I, I did many world records in my career and initially those records just happened by, I wouldn't say accident, but they just happened by the natural progression of the sport and also of myself. The most memorable probably is right now the altitude record, so like the record for the highest um, highland in the world, which I broke two times. The last time I achieved it in uh, 2017 on a 5,700 meter high volcano. Breaking a slack line which was 430 meters long across the volcanoes. So that was a, a big dream of mine to like do not only a very high slack line but also a long high line in that environment. Free solo highlining is what we call a completely untethered walk on a highline. So you, you have no security on yourself, you wear no harness, you have no leash on yourself, so you purely depend on your own skill to survive. I think, it's a, I think it's a supreme mastery of the skill. It's uh, trusting yourself completely and putting your faith in the hours and the thousands of hours that you put into the work you do. It's a personal choice. If you have the confidence and you know you're not gonna fall, then that's an experience that only you can decide whether or not you want. I 
I personally would never do free solo. I made a promise to my mother a long time ago. I will never free solo, and I think, in my opinion, it's a very, so that's my, it's only my opinion because I know a lot of people get a lot of joy out of it. I think it's a very irresponsible thing to do because you've got family, you've got people you love. Free solo is sometimes considered to be like the ultimate form of highlining, which I don't really think it is, but it is definitely a very pure form of highlining. I've started soloing like a couple of years ago, but I also stopped it at some point again because I was just like evaluating the risk against the, the reward I get from it. And I was just for myself deciding that the risk was not worth taking for me. The great thing about highlining that you cannot define one single feeling Fear, I think, is a very um, interesting aspect of highlining because in the very beginning of highlining, fear is everything. Like you panic every time you get on a highline and more or less the biggest challenge in the beginning is to overcome that fear. The fear kind of goes away if you're focused on something else, if you're focused on, for example, the difficulty of the line or something or on the view. I think then it goes away and you can really, you can get really close to feeling no fear at all and being completely free on the line. Once you overcome that fear once, you find ways for yourself to deal with it. So every time you get on the high line, this fear of height, this fear of falling gets a little bit smaller or a little bit more in control. It is just this little nudging feeling inside myself which still tells me that it is dangerous what I'm doing and which still makes me like double check my knot every time I stand up which is good because it is some kind of natural and good respect I have for the height and for the environments we're, we're dealing in and I guess this kind of respect you should never lose. I just really hope I'd never stop highlighting I guess I mean I just cannot really imagine myself stopping. 